This is a unique podcast exploring the criminal justice system and those involved and affected. We'll educate and expose the public as well as potential jurors to what takes place behind the scenes of those who are facing the system. Your host owns a litigation support firm called Justice Technology Professionals, and he works on criminal and civil cases offering support to defendants and counsel. What you're about to hear is an open dialogue opening the minds to the public to what takes place in reality as opposed to what you think takes place ladies and gentlemen welcome to the justice tech pros podcast here's your host dominic crea hello listeners Uh, i wanted to do a podcast today a few things came up that i just wanted to touch on, voice my opinion on. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the hot topic lately with, I was reading an article with Carmine Persico where they're trying to say the guy was an informant. What's crazy to me is, unless, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm viewing this from a totally different, totally different uh, viewpoint. I just, I don't see what everybody's claiming to see, well, not everybody, people who are looking at it see it the way I see it as I've had a few discussions on it. But they're showing this document, and I'll put it up on the uh, on the screen. You'll be able to see it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. They're showing this document, and they're trying to say that this document, I believe from 1970-something, 71 maybe, uh, confirms that Carmine Persico was an informant. Now, what's crazy to me is when I'm looking at the document, you'll notice that there's um, two columns. The column on the left has a heading of uh, Captain or Capo de China, and on the right, it's the symbol number of informant. And then it has a bunch of names underneath the uh, column of Captain, and it has um, Carmine Persico is one of those names. And on the right, it has the symbol number of informant. And if you notice... It has three numbers on the document. Um, This uh, 3461-C-TE. It has three of the exact same numbers, and it's linked to the three individuals on the left of the document. So for me, looking at that, unless I'm not seeing what they're seeing, that tells me that on the left is the target, quote-unquote, and on the right is the informant, the informant number associated with that target. So that tells me that the number on the right um, is an individual who has information on the people on the left. <clears throat> so I don't understand where they're pulling that this means the people on the left are the informants. It's two separate columns. One for the target, which they have labeled as captain, and one on the right, which is the symbol number of the informant. So if you're looking at it, you could, I guess, line up, okay, this informant with this number this 3461-C-TE has information on the individuals, uh, you know, on the left-hand column. That's the way I view it. Now, people are taking it, reporters, this and that, and this is the danger of society. You have somebody looking at that and maybe not understanding what they're looking at. And right away, a story gets run with calling somebody an informant, which this is their only evidence and I don't see it. I don't see what they're really citing or how they're holding on to this because the way I interpret it, it's totally different. And honestly, what's crazy is if you take it a step further and if you plug in that number, that 3461-C-TE and, and you search it, you go on the internet and you search that number, there's a bunch of documents that come linked to Greg Scarpa Sr. So that tells me that was his number. You could just search it. It's a two-second search. And you'll see all these different documents that come up with Greg uh, Scarpa Sr. So that just tells me that that represented his informant number. And that individual, Greg Scarpa, was the one giving information on the people on the left-hand column. And one would think that a reporter or anybody, uh, the lawyers involved that are putting this information out, that they would have taken the time to at least do a quick search, just to search the numbers, search everything up, understand the document, before jumping right away and going immediately to the conclusion, oh, this guy's an informant. To me, they're not reading the document accurately. I don't know how anyone could look at that 
and come up with that determination. That's not what I see. Again, if I saw it, it is what it is, but that's just not what I see, and I'm not here defending. I mean, it's not about that. What I'm just trying to point out is this is how dangerous society could be. They take something that's not accurate, and they make it fit a narrative. Now, it's obvious why they want to push this story. Um, it's very transparent. Obviously, they want to push it for a lot of reasons, and I could see it as a bargaining chip with the government. You know, when they're approaching, say, other people that they want to make flip or they want to turn state's evidence or work for the government, they use a high-profile name like that and say, oh, look, he did it. Why are you not doing it? You know, this is over. You might as well just join Team America. This guy did it. So many people do it that you're not aware of just to almost water it down. So if they're dealing with somebody who's weak-minded, they'll buy into that and, and, and agree. And if somebody's not strong in their constitution, something like this will sway them. Some people, don't matter what they dangle in front of them, they, they have their beliefs and they're not getting swayed one way or the other. Other people who are on the fence, something like this could, could um, affect the decision-making and could impact on how they move forward. So I believe that has a lot to do with it. And once again, unfortunately, you people forget the family aspect of it. You have this gentleman whose family suffered for many, many years watching their, their loved one uh, go through this, then eventually passing away, and now they have to have his name dragged through the mud, which is totally irresponsible of those involved and those who brought this to light without at least diving in deeper. And what I found funny is when you go on the docket, You'll see, a, they're trying to say that this is new and groundbreaking, but this this whole philosophy was shared back in 2016. There was a letter written to the judge, and it's on the docket. Um, and the letter basically says the exact same thing that this new article is saying, that they believed Carmine Persico was a top echelon informant, and they wrote the judge directly. So I don't... I don't know how it's resurfacing now as some newly obtained information, groundbreaking information. I think it, it, it surfaced back in 2016, and I didn't follow what happened with it, but I'm sure if you pull the, the following documents, you'll see, I guess, maybe it just had no legs and it just fizzled out because they realized it wasn't accurate, or maybe somebody just pointed out what I already spoke about in reference to the document how the left column represents one thing and the right column represents another another item. And I, it's crazy to me, but this just gives the public an idea of how these things work. Somebody could get something that's completely baseless and run with it if a reporter picks up on it. And a reporter and those involved don't do their due diligence and don't and don't follow up and try to investigate something more thoroughly than looking at a piece of paper and interpreting it incorrectly. Because in my opinion, that's what was done. That piece of paper to me, the second I looked at it, I knew exactly what it represented. Just common sense. You have the left column, you have the right column, and you have the exact same number uh, associated with everybody in the left column. And now if you take that number I told you and you Google it, you'll see uh, the informant Gregory Scarpa Sr.'s name attached to that number. So I, I'm not understanding the hysteria of it. And then you have podcasts going on confirming it. Yeah, it looks like this guy was an informant. What are they basing that off of? Are they basing it off of the same document I'm looking at that clearly shows two different columns? One giving a list of people's names and one giving the informant number associated with those names? I, I look at that document and say, okay, these are the te top echelon targets that informants are tied to. So they put all individuals that they considered uh, top tier in one column, and they put everybody on the right, all the informants on the right who was giving information on that individual. I'm just not grasping. I I'm just not grasping where this story is going and, and how it has legs that it does. It's in forums. You have everybody, all the forum fools going nuts over it, posting about it. Uh, you have newspapers writing about it, podcasts being done about it, but it's really not accurate. I don't know what they're reading or what the justification is. One would need in-depth on, on uh, analysis on those columns. They would need to know 
okay, why is the same number associated with different people? Why, when I Google that number, does a certain informant show up? These are all questions that needed to be asked prior to, I guess, releasing this, this story. Because if they did, they would see it doesn't really hold any water. The interpretation somebody's trying to give it just doesn't line up. And the bigger picture here that people should be concerned about is that um, look what could be done. Look how easily it is to destroy somebody's name wrongly, to accuse somebody of something that they're not. And one, one of the things I was always brought up with and I believe in, something that's almost as bad as an informant is somebody labeling someone an informant who's not. You can't go around just labeling people that without really having concrete evidence to back that up. You have to really know what you're doing and really make sure it's 100% ironclad before you stick that label on somebody. Because for some, that's a horrible label to have. Some people have their moral compass intact. Some people have ethics. Some people have things that they do believe in and they don't sway and they don't change their beliefs based on what's better for them. Uh, individuals have a strong constitution, so they don't want to be labeled something that isn't warranted and is ina inaccurate. So to do that to somebody really has repercussions that a lot can't see. And that's a, that's a big label to stick on somebody who, from what I've seen, the guy... Unfortunately, you know, he did a ton of time. He wanted to pass it away. The family had to deal with that, had to go through that. It's a horrible, horrible experience. And to come out and try to diminish everything that somebody believed in by labeling them an informant, which to me is very obviously they weren't, number one. Number two, the document doesn't show anything. The document to me just shows, okay, these were the targets, and on the right column are the informants. That's what I see. I don't know how other people see see it differently. I'm, and I look at these things with an open mind. I don't look at them uh, trying to disprove or prove. I just look at them at face value. I investigate it a little, a little, and then I'll conclude. And I just don't see what everybody else, what a lot of people are seeing. I have had some conversations with intelligent people, and they, they see it the way I do, and they're actually just as confused because... We almost feel like we're in an alternate universe that something so clear as day is being misconstrued. And I guess I shouldn't be that shocked by it because I've witnessed that firsthand in court, court cases where you'll show something that is very clear as day and really not up for interpretation, but yet it will be interpreted. And you'll still get, well, I don't see it that way and which boggles my mind. It's not a matter of opinion when you're dealing with facts. It's not a matter of how you view something. It's a matter of saying, well, this is how it is. Look at it. So I, I don't get that. But I have seen that done, so I guess I shouldn't be that shocked. What's concerning is just how quickly something like this blew up based on people not doing their due diligence, people not analyzing something and taking their time before they start releasing these things. I just, I don't agree with it from what I'm viewing. I don't see it. I don't know what they're pointing to. That's so, uh, that's such a, a revelation. I, I don't see it. I see a document that on the left houses top echelon targets uh, and the informants associated with those targets. And on the right, you have the informants with their number. And there was some, um, there was some numbers redacted out so that could be either they're still alive or I don't know what the reasoning is for that. But there are more numbers also redacted out when you go through the whole document. But I think the lesson everybody should really just gain from something like this, you can't, obviously we know you can't believe what you read. But even if you're reading something, look into it. Look at what they're showing and analyze it for yourself. Take two minutes to understand it before you, you draw conclusions. And there's going to be people... You could show them clear as day if eventually these reporters or these people come out and say we made a mistake. It doesn't matter. You're going to get people who are going to hold on to it, and that's going to be their go-to go now. They're going to say, oh, didn't you see that uh, Carmine Persico was an informant, which he's not and wasn't, 
but they'll still use that. You run one story, and some people will use that as all their citations. They won't follow up with future citations that maybe alter that initial perspective. They'll just hold on to the one that fits their narrative that they want to push. So they'll grab this one citation, the one or two articles, they'll grab some of the forums, comments, and and they'll use that to promote their agenda. And that's the shame part of it all. Now they have something in print that they're going to try to revert to and cite and discuss and promote. And people will have to just be like, no, that's nonsense. This is what came out later. If they do, I don't even know if they will. It's very rare. You see a lot of these reporters and people admit when they're wrong. They just may make it die out and it'll be, it'll be out there forever for others to come across and read. But again, I don't know what I'm, what I'm missing. I don't know if I'm reading it wrong. I doubt it. It's pretty clear cut to me. I just don't get how, based on that document, all of these things take place. Podcasts, news articles, uh, discussions, people saying, oh, it's fact, he's an informant. I, I don't get how that conclusion is jumped to immediately off of a baseless document that, in my view, reads completely opposite, in which the lawyer and the the uh, reporter is trying to have you believe it reads. To me, it's very clear cut. One column, you have the top echelon targets on the informants page, where you have the informants on the right column associated we, with the individuals in the left column. So I, I don't get it. I don't get what's so, what's so hard to understand about that, and I don't get how it's even up for interpretation. To me, the document doesn't say anything regarding... Carmine Persico being an informant. It just shows that he was on the government's, he was in the government's crosshair. And those were, along with other names, his name isn't the only name. There's a lot of names in that left column. So now they're trying to say every name in the left column was an informant. I mean, it's crazy. There's nothing to justify that. There's nothing to support that. The people in the right-hand column with the numbers identifying who they are, are the ones informing on the guys in the left column. That's how I see it. So I I don't really get it. But the bigger picture is, look how these things could get taken and run with. You know, anybody could go out and say anything, and then you'll get the believers that are behind them or their supporters, and it doesn't matter if it's true or not, they're just going to support them blindly. Unfortunately, a lot of people aren't free thinkers, so they just go with the crowd. And if they have, um, you know, on the podcast, as I spoke about, uh, the the, the inform, an informant was doing a podcast about it, and now you're going to get super fans who just believe every word out of somebody's mouth, and now they're going to just run with that narrative. It's a dangerous thing to do. You ruin somebody's reputation off of nonsense, off of information that's baseless and has, holds no water. I'm hoping it eventually gets flushed out just for the family. I mean, let the guy... The guy's gone. Let him rest in peace. Leave the leave the family no alone. Leave the names alone. It's just this is society. Unfortunately, they just jump on these things, and the family's left and friends are left to pick up the pieces and have to deal with it. And you have to realize what happens now is the informants. All these informants now have the podcast, which we spoke about. They're going to use that to justify their own moves to themselves. As I hinted at earlier, they're going to use that now to say, oh, look, well, this guy, if this guy was supposedly this big time uh, organized crime individual and he decided to become informant, it makes sense that I was an informant. You know, they're just going to use that to justify, again, for me personally, nobody influences my beliefs. I don't care what anybody does. That doesn't have any impact on what I'm going to do. So that's just a weak minded excuse if they try to use that to to support whatever decisions they make. And number one, it's completely false. You're just making something up. It's like just making something up and saying, using that as your rationale. At least use something that's legitimate, not a fantasy story that was completely wrong from the beginning. And the shame part is, now you're going to see this spread like wildfire all over YouTube. People are going to be using it and citing it and doing stories about it. And it's just going to put a false label on somebody that they didn't deserve. And it's going to take time if the lawyers involved, the families involved want to undo that. they got to do a lot of work to get that undone. I'm hoping 
perhaps more people will put out what I'm referring to to show that the document is not saying what people are trying to have you believe it's saying. It's, to me, it's a pretty standard document where they list the individuals that are on their uh, on their scope to focus on and informants that are giving them information on those people. That's how I see it. It's pretty black and white to me when I look at it. But you'll see it's going to spread all over and there'll be columns about it. And it's, I just hope some legitimate individuals, some dedicated journalists, people who are in it for the right reasons will investigate a little more and uncover it just for the own, for the simple purpose of somebody shouldn't be labeled something they're not. That's all. Regardless of my beliefs, regardless, that's irrelevant. I just don't believe anybody should be labeled something that they're not. That's all. You, you shouldn't inherit a false label based on incompetence and that's all that happened here uh, the actions of those who started this came from a place of negligence and not taking the time to really exhaust efforts and they unfortunately ran with something that wasn't accurate so hopefully you get some solid journalists uh, who will kind of dive into that and maybe show the public, break down for the public exactly what the document is and and uh, at least show the other side of this. That once again, a false label was given and now many are trying to run with it. There was a journalist, and I put his information on my website and stuff, Bill Moshi. He would be a good guy to run with this. That guy seemed to really expose everything and and he wrote a ton of articles on it, ton of segments on it, he really he really exposed what goes on within the system and, and uh, techniques like this that are used. So I, I, again, I have his information on my website. If you ever want to read his articles, I put links. But he, he was a big time investigative journalist and he uh, really ran with it his whole career and he exposed a lot. And what I liked about him is he was on the other side of the fence at the beginning until he saw a lot of the tech tactics the government took, the informants that they used, the lies being spread, and then he, uh, his own uh, moral beliefs had him focus on the reality of the situation as opposed to just putting out the narrative that was common and acceptable. So I, I give a, I, I like his work, everything I've read I liked. He's a good guy to look up and pull his information. Again, if you go to my uh, website, you'll, you'll read a lot of his uh, segments and what he wrote about. It's important information. It's good for jurors to read that kind of stuff. One side amusing note I wanted to touch on that seems to be more and more the norm. On all these podcasts within this realm, uh, as I talk about, you have informants and then you have just regular individuals talking about the informants. And you get some of these podcasts, which I don't get it, in one in one breath... They're using the term rat left and right, rat, rat, rat. And then in the background, you see who's getting phone calls from informants, who's commenting, that's an informant, which is fine. I just find it crazy that you honestly should drop the term rat. Just leave it alone. It's obvious that that's not a big deal. Uh, you're okay with, with that, which everybody's entitled to. But it's a little confusing. In one segment, if somebody's using the term rat left and right, and talking about who's a rat and who's not a rat. And then in the background, there's informants commenting. There's informants uh, on their platform. Informants being interviewed. I don't know. That's crazy to me. Just pick a lane and stick with it. Pick a belief and stick with it. If uh, if you are okay with certain people informing, that's fine. But to throw around the rat term left and right and then interact, I, I can't get it. I can't wrap my head around that. I don't know, maybe I'm not that bright, that's why I can't understand it, but it's just very odd to me, that whole dynamic in, in one breath to be quote-unquote rat, rat bashing certain people that are supposedly, in, that are informants, not supposedly, that are informants, and then in the next breath, taking comments or having them on your show or interacting with them, I don't get it. I think you just got to stay away from that term, stop using rat, leave it alone, just... 
you're, you're fine with informants. You just don't like certain ones because of maybe personality conflict, but I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that they informed because if you don't like somebody because they informed, then how can you like somebody else who is guilty of the same thing? It doesn't make sense. I think it needs to be clarified when a lot of these podcasts don't like individuals or they're bashing individuals, it has nothing to do with the fact that they they don't like them because they're informants. They just don't like them for personal reasons, which is fine. I, I think where I get confused is when it gets painted as something else, where they come out with this huge, again, quote-unquote, anti-rat uh, campaign, but then as time goes by, who's talking with them, texting with them, commenting with them, they're commenting on the show, they're planning future shows, they're on their shows, then then I don't understand. Then it all goes uh, then, then it all goes out the window to me because I don't even get that. If if you are going to put out there that you're against informants, then you got to be across the board with it. If you're not, then that's fine. Make it clear. You're not against informants. You're okay with people informing. You just don't like certain individuals for personal reasons. That's fine. That, everybody's different. That's what you believe in. I think where a lot of the listeners get confused is one minute you read or see one thing and then the next minute there's all kinds of association with people that are being, that are doing the exact same thing you supposedly are against. So I don't get that. I just wanted to share that thought because maybe somebody else could relate to it or, or explain it to me because I don't get it. I think they're better off just coming out from inception saying I have nothing against informants to each their own, I, I weigh each situation differently, and I don't like this person who happens to be an informant, but the reason I don't like him has nothing to do with the fact that he's an informant. That would at least make sense, and then you could decide whether you want to listen or not, but at least that makes sense, but when I saw a lot of them come out starting like where apparently they were doing this anti-rat thing, and then as time goes by, who's friends with who, who's texting who, who's reading statements from informants to clarify things, who's having them on their show. It gets very confusing. And as I said, that's why the one guy I like and I uh, support is that Mob Rats Exposed. I like his show. I haven't seen him do any of that yet. And he's been on for over a month. And I don't believe that's his style. I think he makes it clear he just doesn't align with informants and he's going to stay away from them. He don't like them in his chat. He's not going to give them a platform. Whether you agree with it or not, you have to you have to respect the fact that he drew a line as far as his interaction with informants, and that's what he stands by. You know, and then you get a lot of people where they go, oh, but he's hypocritical or anybody's saying, because he talks to this person who talks to a rat. Or the, well, now it's getting crazy. I mean, listen, this is YouTube. Nobody's hanging out with each other. Nobody's buddies. People are interacting. But... There's a big difference between interacting with somebody who's a directly an informant and somebody who has a podcast who may deal with informants. That's a little different. Now you're just talking about podcasters interacting with each other. So I don't I don't really see that connection. We're not talking about personal lives and who's going over each other's house and who's going out for drinks. Uh, to me, that gets a little crazy when they start, well, this one associates with this one who doesn't, you know, now you're doing background checks on people to see who talks to who. I mean, it's YouTube for God's sakes. It's not that important. I just judge the individual based on their individual actions. I don't do 13 degrees of Kevin Bacon on the person. I just don't do that. But a lot of people I know do that, but then they're the biggest hypocrites because then they should shine the light on the people they associate with. It's just crazy. <laughs> I don't know. It's just so, there's so much crazy behind the scenes information and things that you see and you have to laugh at and you have to thank God you're not really involved in any of that. My, my purpose on here is, has more to do with the direction of my organization and we listen to things and we pull things to help defendants, to help other attorneys. We build a database with information and snapshots and comments to help possibly future cases, things coming up. So there's a meaning behind why I have to view certain things because the truth is I couldn't, I wouldn't want to be bothered. Although I would probably still listen to the ones that make me laugh because that's different. That's entertaining. That stuff cracks me up. But I wouldn't uh, listen to a lot of the ones that I, I, I turn on and try to uh, 
where I tell somebody in my team to turn on and record or capture things. I definitely wouldn't be that involved. Uh, what else did I want to talk about? I wanted to tell a little bit of a story uh, in general, just how, and I spoke on this, how when somebody's involved in the prison system or the BOP, I don't think the public really realizes how they're able to do what they want to do, and it's hard to fight it, and it's hard to get involved, even when you have a team that's on it. You have a team of lawyers, family members. And, I, and I'll give you an example. They could take somebody, and they could just put them in the shoe, or the hole, whatever you want to call it, um, segregation unit, you know, isolation, uh, without a definitive cause. What they could cite is they could say, well, we have something under investigation, so this person is now in the shoe. Now, when you're in the shoe, just to give you an idea, uh, excuse if you hear my dog barking in the background. Sorry about that. But when you're in the shoe, just to give you an idea, you're not allowed to make any phone calls immediately. Um, what winds up happening is you make one phone call every 30 days. So you'll have family friends, attorneys trying to contact the person, or I should say waiting to be contacted from the person, and they don't hear nothing. They call the jail or the prison or wherever the person's housed, and they won't tell you anything. They won't tell you they're in the shoe. They won't tell you anything. They won't share any information. So you have to do a lot of digging. You have to do a lot of emails. You have to contact the, the warden. You have to, you really get put through the hoops, and they won't really tell you anything. Eventually, they may just tell you, okay, he's in the segregation unit, and that's all they'll tell you. They don't tell you why. You'll try to set up, they have um, attorney calls. Now, when an attorney call, you put a call request in, usually it's via email, and then they schedule it. Again, they're holding all the cards with that. They don't have to give you the call right away. They could wait. They schedule it when they want. They'll cancel it a lot of the times. They'll cut it short. So it's very stressful and chaotic when you don't know the rationale behind something. So you try to investigate, you try to see what's going on. You, you also want to make sure that the person's doing okay, their well-being mentally, physically, making sure they're in good shape. And you feel helpless because you have no outlet. Emails aren't getting responded to, letters aren't getting responded to. So you have to up your up your game, try to get a hold, make sure the attorneys get involved, and even them, they give them the runaround. And when you finally get to it, they never really have to give you a reason of why somebody's in the shoe. They could just say, well, an investigation's taking place. But they won't tell you what the investigation's for or anything. Now, I've dealt with somebody being in there for three months. Three months without any inclination why, no rationale why, uh, no, no reason. It, all very vague. It just kept going to investigation. And then they'll let them out. And that'll be the end of that. They'll just get out and that'll be the end of that. They won't tell you why. My point just is, people don't understand how little control you have when you're in that situation. You really have no ability to control what goes on, how to, how to correspond, how to get answers. They control all that. They decide what to tell you, what not to tell you. They decide who gets calls. They decide what they're going to tell the inmate, even the inmate won't even know. They'll say, I have no idea what's going on. When you do speak to them that one time a month, they'll have no idea what's going on. They'll say, all they keep telling me is there's an investigation. So they'll have nothing concrete to cite them with. Now, don't get me wrong. We have good teams. So our, our attorneys were on it. Members of uh, family were on it. They actually went to the prison to get answers. But again, you, you could bitch and moan, for lack of a better way of putting it, as much as you want. Inevitably, the warden, the prison, they're going to do what they want to do. When they decide it's over, then it's over. It's very hard to sway them. It's very hard to get information out of them. And it's very hard to understand why <coughs> they decided to put somebody in the shoe without any backing behind it. And it's like pulling teeth to get the information and to to fight for the person, and you realize how little control you have. And don't forget, when they're in the shoe, they don't get commissary, they don't get anything like that. They don't get to go out, they're locked up pretty much 24 hours a day. I think they get out a couple times a week for a shower, and that's about it. You're not allowed to send them books, you can't send them anything to read. It's not a, it's not a good experience, uh, to say the least. 
And what's even frustrating when you have family, friends, they're trying to find out what's going on and there's no answers. You can't really give anything. You don't know. You just got to wait it out. And then you, you're relieved when it passed. But it's shocking how quickly they could change and disrupt somebody's routine. And they could just shake things up and they could decide whatever they want to decide. The control is all is it, all in their court. They decide whether to keep somebody in there, whether to let them out of there. And that's one thing that I'm starting to learn is how little control you really do have once somebody is in the system. And people don't realize that. They think you have all these rights and there's all these groups and all these organizations for prison rights. And Try calling and email them. See how that works out. See how long it takes for them to get back to you. See how long it takes for them to get your answers. Unless you go through it, they have a, a beautiful picture, a false picture. It's a false facade of all of these checks and balances. You know, it looks great. Oh, we have all these organizations. They can't do this. They can't do that. It all looks great. It plays well for the public. The public buys into it. Unfortunately, you don't know the reality of the situation until you're faced with it. You don't realize how, although they do a lot of good, a lot of time these organizations don't want to be bothered with certain people. If somebody has a label, they don't really want to help. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to see what's going on for the family or try to get answers. There's a lot of um, hypocrisy where in one breath they say they're trying to help people who are incarcerated, but in the next breath they're picking and choosing who to help, which to me, that's not right. Either you're going to help people or you're not. If you say you're going to help a certain group of individuals, then you got to help them. You can't pick and choose. But my point just is when you see the whole picture and you're in the system and you see the power they have and what they can do and what you can't do, it's sobering. You have to recognize that, you have to respect that, and you have to navigate that whole process in a different way than you normally would. Normally, when you're able to do things and you're able to fight back and you're able to investigate, you could approach the situation a little differently. Once you see the control or lack thereof that you have, you have to alter the way in which you approach things. Uh, It's important for family to realize and defendants to realize You have to change your mindset a little bit on how to approach those things when you realize you don't have control. And it's not even like you have a little control. From what I've witnessed, you have none. To even understand why, look at it this way, you're being put into isolation and you don't even know why. You're not even getting a clear picture of it for, for months. And then they'll use an excuse of an investigation. Everything's kind of vague. There's nothing clear cut. You would think to be put, to take out of a population, put into the hole or the shoe, there has to be a specific incident that took place that you could revert back to and say, okay, that's why that's why I'm here. When you can't do that and those things are just done, that's an eye opener, I'll tell you that much. That's an eye opener. And it really gives you a perspective of what you're dealing with. And how to navigate those things and the little power that even attorneys have. Attorneys don't have much power with internal things with the jail. They don't have the right to represent the client, go in there and see what's going on. And They strip them of that. They pretty much tell them it's not your territory. Yeah, you could have a phone call with your client, but at our leisure, when we decide it's good, even that you would figure they have to do it within a certain amount of time, you know? Like, let's just say they have a policy, whereas... Uh, all inmates are entitled to a call within 48 hours of the request made by the attorney. Something like that would make sense. They don't even have that. It's pretty much up to the person fielding those requests when they get time to schedule it. And I'm not saying that they do it on purpose. Don't misunderstand me. I'm sure there's a lot of inmates. There's a lot of calls. So I'm sure they're doing their job, the person fielding that. But it's just not acceptable. There should be a better system in place. I'm not blaming that person. I'm blaming the system overall. There should be a much, today, with all the advancements we have in computers and scheduling and the programs, there should be a nice, clear, easy system to schedule calls routinely and not have to go through all these jumps and hoops to get things done. That's what I'm saying. It just doesn't make sense logistically. One would figure there's a much better system that could be rolled out. I'm sure I could think of something if that was my job, 
to have things run a little more streamlined. I've done that my whole life with things, uh, implemented systems and procedures to have things run, run more streamlined and less chaotic. So if I could do it, I'm very sure people who run a prison are able to do it. Those are really the points I wanted to touch on today. Um, the Persico thing I thought was important, just in the sense it gives such a big picture of how lies could be spread and false labels could be used and people run with it. And it has a lot to do with incompetence and negligence and accountability. People don't want to take the time. Just investigate it a little bit. Just understand it a little. Um, I'll put the document up so you'll see what I was talking about. Uh, it'll, it'll be on here so you can look at the screen. But to me, I, I don't see it at all the way they're trying to label it. And unfortunately, I'm sure this story is going to have legs for a while. And, um, uh, you know, hopefully the attorneys will push back a lot and really lay out my th the way I see it. Hopefully they see it and they can lay out their thoughts on it just to undo whatever damage has been done. Because I, I could see it every day. There's a new article, there's a new blog post on it. Uh, more people are talking about it. Like I said, podcasts are being done on it. So hopefully people will get their facts straight before they start spreading this false narrative because that's all it is. It's just not accurate. The document doesn't say what they're trying to say it says. To me, it's very black and white. I don't understand the confusion. I, I know I said this, but it's hard to wrap your head around something. If you're looking at something, let's just say I'm looking at my business card right now. My, my logo is gold. So if I show it to you and I go, yeah, look at the logo, it's gold. I wouldn't even think twice. And then somebody comes back to me and says, no, it's white. I'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? It's white. Where do you see white? You know, that's, that's a whole different conversation when you're looking at something concrete and you're seeing it specifically laid out one way and somebody's interpreting it another way. You just want to be like, are you crazy? This isn't up for interpretation. This is fact. This is what it is. How are you interpreting that? That's like changing everything. Okay, let's let's pretend these words don't mean nothing. Uh, what if I tell you informant doesn't mean informant? It's code word for uh, something else. What if I told you that top echelon doesn't mean top echelon? It's I mean, if you start changing things to fit what you want it to believe, now, now I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. Now it's like, <laughs> what are we even discussing here? You're just changing what we're looking at to suit whatever you want to believe it to mean. That's the way I see this thing playing out. So hopefully uh, the other side gets a little bit of a voice and starts pointing to the facts of it and not the uh, hypotheses of those trying to draw a conclusion that doesn't exist. Let's start focusing on the facts of the paper. And I noticed they kept uh, referencing how they showed the paper to, I think it was Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice says you know, it's a legitimate paper. Yeah, the legitimacy of the paper isn't being called into question. That's almost playing with words. That's like using the response to give yourself uh, validity. But that's that's playing with words because that's not the that's not the question that should be asked. Uh, I believe it's a legitimate document. I don't think the document was altered or doctored. It's a fake. That's not the issue at all. The issue has nothing to do with the document's legitimacy. The issue has to do with what's what's being said in the document, the headings. We have one heading, as I explained, the captain, one heading, the informant. That should be the question. It would just be, okay, just to clarify. So the people, in, the numbers in the right-hand column that correspond to the targets in the left-hand column, that just represents the right-hand column is the informant and the left-hand column is the target. Is that correct? Those would be my questions, not... To me, that was almost, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I assume that was almost like a, uh, a an intentional deflection tactic where they're trying to bring validity to it without actually addressing the issue. You know, they're handing the document, just saying, oh, can you just confirm this is a legitimate document? Yeah, it's a legitimate document. Okay, see, they said it's legitimate. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not the question. The question is not the legitimacy of the document. The question is the context of the document. That's what needs to be questioned. Just to understand what it's saying. Get clarification on the left column and the right column. Get clarification on why when you Google that number, that informant number, that it all comes linked up to one informant's name. Those are the clarifications you got to get. 
uh, I think that was a little trick of misdirection, in my opinion, trying to cite that we asked the DOJ and they confirmed that this is a, a real document. Uh, I don't think anybody's questioning if it was a real document. I think the debate right now has to do with the elements of the document and what everything represents. So to me, that was a little sleight of hand move, in my opinion. And I, I wanted to just spotlight that a little bit because I believe that's what was going on. And I guess that's it for today. Till next time. You've been listening to the Justice Tech Pros podcast with Dominic Crea, one of the most unique podcasts on the internet, discussing the obstacles the defense team faces when trying a case, what goes on behind the scenes during pretrial and motion phase, holding defense attorneys accountable, making sure they're fighting for their clients, the difference between textbook law and how things truly play out in a courtroom, and everything in between. And everything in between. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show and we'll be back soon until then find us on twitter facebook and instagram at justice tech pros to email the show with questions and comments it's podcast at justice tech pros.com till next time this is justice tech pros podcast and dominic crea signing off